Welcome to the Enterprise Excellence Podcast, where our purpose is to help create a better future. Learn from our world's experts how to improve your organization sustainably. Learn how to achieve and sustain an excellence journey for yourself, others, and the planet. And I'm your host, Brad Jevons, coming to you from Brisbane, Australia. We are proudly brought to you in association with SA Partners, a world-leading business transformation consultancy. SA Partners are a truly purposeful company focused on helping organisations achieve sustainable improvement for themselves, others, and the planet. Welcome to episode 37 of the Enterprise Excellence Podcast. It is wonderful to have on the show with us today, Philippe Engineer Manriquez. Philippe is an international speaker and practitioner in Lean and Agile. He is committed to sharing decades of construction industry excellence experience as a host of the EBFC Show podcast and through the work he does helping the industry and as a member of the Lean Construction Institute. Philippe is passionate about helping the construction industry, amongst others, to improve and create a better future. Let's get into the episode. Philippe, thank you so much for joining us today. Brad, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity to have the tables turned on me, and I get to answer any question and all questions that you have and your listeners have. I'm looking forward to that, mate. I'm glad to have you in the hot seat for a change. <laughs> so, so, Philippe. What's your, what is your backstory? So, you know, where did your journey start applying lean and agile in the construction industry? All right. Thank you for that, Brad. Yeah. I started off, uh, graduated as electrical engineer, didn't learn about lean in college at university. And that was over 20 years ago. I started working, uh, on a research building. Didn't learn about lean on that first project. That was a few years. Fast forward halfway through my career at the time, it was the, the then cutting edge of my career, a decade. I finally learned about lean construction and I learned about it from a, a director at our company that had uh, some lean manufacturing experience and they were talking at a seminar and just going over some of the things that they tried on their projects, like methods like pull planning, or we call in lean construction, last planner system of production controls, which is a pull framework and some other things like 5S, which I'm sure a lot of people have at least heard of or just you know, being uh, intentional and organizing and cleaning on sites and in offices as well. And I saw something in those uh, people on that team. I saw happy people. And Brad, I wanted some of that happiness. So I uh, approached the gentleman after the presentation, got to talking, and he recommended a book. He recommended Lean Thinking by Womack and Jones, which a lot of people are familiar with, especially uh, executives. I know it's a very popular business read. It's been at the top of the charts for a long time. And, and that was my, my foray in that's where I got started. And once I read through the first two chapters, and at that time I was working seven days a week and, uh, in order to get involved in the lean group at the company, you had to read a lean book. And I just decided to read that one. Cause that was what the only lean book I knew. I didn't even know what lean was. At the time, so then from from Womack, I got the good definition of what lean is, and I got bit by the bug, and I've been doing it ever since. And then later, because I changed how I work, Brad, I was able to come across some of the work that Dr. Jeff Sutherland had done and discovered Agile and Scrum, and actually in reverse order, discovered Scrum first and then Agile later. And here I am still doing it all these years later. Yeah. Yeah, I've got to say, Philip, like you and I were on the same Scrum at Scale training, different parts of the world <laughs> yes, on we Scrum were. at Scale, but wasn't wasn't amazing. Like it was, there's so many different elements, even though it's built on Lean, there's a lot of different techniques and elements that come in. I found it really good. Yeah, I did too. And it was really, what I liked hearing was people, even in different industries, having exactly the same struggles that we're having in the design and construction industry. Yeah. I was on a banking seminar recently talking to the finance industry and they're having the same challenges, which is just the pace of execution. You know, and I don't know what you thought, but I thought, wow, you know, scrum at scale sort of gives that high level element of pace of execution within an even pace of work. Yeah. Or at least a smooth pace of work that people can reliably do and keep themselves satisfied and their people waiting for what they're doing satisfied because yeah that's what it's all about we got to deliver something right brad we just can't uh, work and iterate forever at some point we got to hand it off and let somebody enjoy the fruits of our labor yeah yeah it's amazing like your background in that construction industry because it is such a massive industry 
like in Australia, I know it, it just holds up such a big part of the economy. And I'm, I'm sure it's the same in Europe and America where you're based and everywhere. Well, this is really. where I did some preparation, Brad, for this topic. So to give a paint a picture, let's paint a little picture here. <laughs> Worldwide, I heard a stat at a conference recently, uh, recently is like within the last 90 days, and it's all of uh, March of uh, 2021. And someone had said that about one out of seven, one out of eight people worldwide work in construction in one way, shape, or form. And I just thought wow. that's a right, Brian. That's a massive number. It's a lot Huge. of people. Yeah. And I don't know about in Australia, but in the United States, uh, annually the spend on construction, as measured by the U.S. government, is around three trillion a year. <laughs> and and of that three trillion dollars U.S., um, that employs over a million people. I'm sorry, employs over eleven million people in that are classified as uh construction professionals and construction workers yeah it's massive, massive. isn't it I, like i don't know the stats in australia but it's prevalent you know the, there is the feeling and the knowledge that australia hangs a lot on the construction industry yeah i mean you just can't uh, you that's... can't get around town right brad and not notice things under construction everywhere you go at all times whether it's infrastructure or you know industrial construction or just buildings just around town where you are even housing yeah yeah well that's what i love what you do billy you know and especially your focus because you know everything that i'm about in this podcast is about is creating that better future economically environmentally and socially where you look at it with your niche and your focus your focus is on probably one of the biggest bang for buck outcomes that if we can achieve productivity if we can achieve greater outcomes socially if we can achieve greater outcomes environmentally it is a big hit like there is massive gains massive there. gains and we know that the potential brand is incredible too like there have been uh, research projects that have gone on for decades where they've studied just those very things like how efficient is construction as compared to agriculture or manufacturing and i've got some of the stats in the u.s and mm -hmm. and we learned at our at our scrum training that process efficiency from a lean manufacturing perspective is considered 25%. When something is at least 25% efficient, it's considered lean and successful. And you're thinking like 25% is terrible. You know, that's like if on a letter grade scale, that's an F, F, F minus, 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 minus. Like you're not even, <laughs> you don't even show up or write your name on the test probably to get a 25%. You certainly don't take it home to your parents. No, you don't. It doesn't get put on the refrigerator unless it's to shame you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh but i think go ahead brian the size of the prize is so big like i know i have friends in construction industry in australia and i hear their pain i don't i don't work in the construction industry or anything like that but through my friends i hear their pain of the things that come up that create unevenness overburden waste right it's just crazy right overburden is something that uh for people that don't know that phrase like we do, Brian, because you and I are thinking a little bit of the lean nerd side. Yeah. <laughs> Overburden is anything that's akin to, I like to think of it as like pressure. Pressure we put on ourselves or pressure we put on people. And in, in the construction industry, sometimes people think that that's their responsibility as leaders on the project is to keep the pressure on so that people can deliver. And, you know, human beings, we need a little bit of constraints. I mean, there's got to be an end date or you know, it's just going to the beach, which this is not what this is. This is, mm -hmm. you know, we have to accomplish something. So we, we have some of that, but there's also additional pressure. And a lot of times, Brad, in the construction industry, that comes from the client. The client sets the tone for an entire project team. You know, even like a, a medium-sized construction project here, at least in the United States, would be something around the sub $50 million dollars for a project which could be accomplished in a year year and a half and then something on the larger scale could be a billion dollar project and there are bigger projects and there are bigger ones definitely in australia as well bigger than a billion dollars us and those projects can have thousands of people thousands whereas even that smaller 50 million size project can have hundreds up to like maybe 200 people craft mm -hmm. professionals and managers and professionals inside the office of management alike and in those situations, you've got this like pressure on the team to deliver something when that something is not fully baked at the time that everybody's signing that contract, making mm. those promises. So some there's that uncertainty part, which is a big topic of conversation in project management spheres. How do you deal with that uncertainty? 
And one of the things I really like about Agile and Scrum in particular, and, and I don't I don't know the other systems as well as uh, Scrum. That is my Agile framework of choice. And it's a framework, not a method. A lot of people get that mistaken. Yeah. Uh, I really like how you can take the things that you have to do and put it inside of that, that framework and deliver what you need to deliver, regardless of whether your enterprise is agile or not. That is not uh, prescriptively required. So I like that. I like that. Yeah, it's, it's, I found the same, Philip. It's just, it really creates that good, you know, framework of systems to be able to really create greater pace, greater even flow. All the things you and I are talking about with those three core top level challenges that businesses have with unevenness, overburden, and all the waste that comes into play. Yeah. Look, what what have you found in the construction industry? Like, what are the secret elements that you would say the two, three, four key ones that would help a construction industry go to a new level and really start moving down a path of greater performance? Yeah, I think one of the first things is, and this is something that a lot of people like Jim Womack would tell you right out the gate, don't do it. He'll say, don't benchmark right away. Like Jim Womack is the, or the, or was the head of the Lean Enterprise Institute. And they studied, he, you know, his claim to fame when he wrote The Machine That Changed the World. That's a great book. Anybody interested in excellence and enterprise-wide excellence, highly recommend The Machine That Changed the World, which was recently updated too. And I, I read the new updated version. Um, they talk about their experiences as researchers going into all these lean organizations or just organizations in general. And they, and they kind of benchmark the automobile assembly industry and assembly is because car manufacturing is more, is more moving towards assembly and the highly, uh, interconnected supply chain. So like, I mean, cars today are from raw steel coming into the, the assembly line to out is minutes. It's measured in minutes now. It's not even measured in in weeks or months like we measure projects in construction. So I think, you know, some of it, if you're in the construction space and you're listening to this and whether you're an executive, a superintendent, a, a site manager, you just need to step back and just look at what do you have? Don't compare yourself to other people, but just look at what do you have? And one of the things I had uh, a guest on my show recently, he would, he'd be a site manager overseas, but a superintendent here in the United States. And he said, we don't even recognize today, unless you step back and learn about lean, how, how much harder it is to work every day. Like how much more effort it takes just to get the thing done that 10 years ago you can show up. And I had the same experience. Like when I, I'm so old, Brad, I know you can't tell from this receding gray hairline, but I'm so old that when I first started my very first construction project, we didn't even use email. We use fax machines. Yeah, I can relate <laughs> to that, Philip. I can relate to that. <laughs> And I'm not talking about like the 1980s for those of you listening, like it was the 2000s and I was working on a construction team with a team and the project manager told me, I think email is going to be a fad. The company has it, oh, wow. but I don't think it's going to stick around. Fax machines oh, are really efficient and good. That's amazing. <laughs> so Brad, with, to answer your question a really long way, sometimes we're so close to the work that we don't step back and see you know, what else is out there? And I was just talking to somebody that's going to be coming on a recent or a newer show of mine for later this year about technology in our space. And like one of the things that we, we have to kind of survey out there in the marketplace and see like, what technology can we use? Like, I know you've got a lot of sales experience, like as a, as a project manager, am I selling when I'm working on a site? I mean, the answer is yes. People in your business development are going to tell you, yes, you're selling the way you execute the job, right, Brad? So like yeah. we have to wear many hats and that responsibility, we don't always give people the training and the tools to be successful with the responsibilities that we hold them to. So like for people in the industry, take a look at, just get a sense of like how hard is it or easy. And if it feels hard, then you might want to adopt lean or agile. Yeah, because it can make it easier for sure. Yeah. So that's one thing is like, just get a sense of like, take your temperature. Am I 98.6? Am I 101 degrees? If I'm burning up, apply ice, right? So yeah. if you're on a if you're on a project, and you're behind schedule, do not apply more people, more people. That's the second gem yes. I'm going to give you, Brad, I'm gonna give you the second yeah. gem. And that's something we borrowed from Brooks Law and software. 
in software, uh, a gentleman by the name of Brooke, and I learned this in Jeff's training back in 2016, like way long time ago, Brad. And he still talks about it. I think they mentioned it at the Scrum and Scale training as well. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah. When a project is late, we know that adding more people exponentially makes it later. Right? We know that because uh, software development can measure when people are actively working on what codes that they deliver. And they can and they can data mine and see what's happening. And as projects get late, and the same is true in construction. Our knee-jerk response when we're late, and the same is true in a construction company doing an initiative or some kind of change process or starting up a new business entity within the organization. Every time something starts to slip from that forecast, the temptation is just add more people. Add yeah. more people. Right, Brand? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you just create that communication chaos and it all just starts to decline. It, and it does decline and it declines predictably. So the, the second thing is don't add more people. Look at what can we take away? Let's focus on the essential. That's the third thing. So now that we're not going to add more people or just throw more money at something, because throwing more money at it too also slows things down, believe it or not. Having the constraint of not having enough money to do something just sparks all kinds of creativity in human beings. We are amazing at problem solving. You don't have to teach a child how to walk, Brad. They just yeah. start doing it naturally by trial and error. It's a trial and error process. The same is true yeah. for language. We don't teach children the alphabet. We just talk to them and they learn how to speak. And then later we teach them the alphabet so they can read and write. And the same is true in lean. The first thing you, you don't wanna do is just like, I don't wanna recommend a thousand books to people. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna recommend a thousand books, but I will recommend just a couple of ideas. So that third idea, you've taken your temperature and you realize you're not happy, you're frustrated with how things are going. Let's make a change. Let's do what, what I learned from Jim Womack and people at the Lean Enterprise Institute. Let's do an experiment. Let's try something different. If you just keep doing the same thing that you've done, if you're on a one year job or a 10 year job, it doesn't matter. If you maintain the same inputs and outputs and processes, you're going to be in the same state of chaos all the way to the end. Yeah. So you've got to do what's called a safe to fail experiment. So one, one cool thing you could do is you could start to plan a little more. And I'm talking about little planning. And the way that we do little planning in Agile and Scrum in particular, we call the daily Scrum or the daily stand-up meeting or the daily huddle, or you pick your flavor of what you want to call it. But it's the people responsible for delivering something come together for 15 minutes or less. And they talk about what did they just accomplish? What are they working on? And what help do they need, if any? And then you don't problem solve in that short little meeting. Now that meeting, Brad, why I'm giving that daily stand-up is like the thing to help you with, with number three after you've taken your temperature and you're like, oh, geez, I'm burning up here with inefficiencies and my efficiency is like 1%. I, I better do something. What do I do? I got to take my medicine. The minimum effective dose is to increase communication flow. Yeah. That's why that daily, that daily standup is very effective. And Brad, I've told you, I nerded out on this. There is a, a, a state of agile report. It's the 14th report. It's published now for free. You can read it, Brad, I'll send you a link so that your listeners can find it and read it from themselves. And I found that reading that report, the annual report of agile, where they survey about 40,000 respondents a year for 14 years and Agile's was born in 20, 2001, whereas Scrum was arguably born in 1993, 1995, depending on if you ask Jeff, it's 95 when it was published at a conference, but he'd been using it earlier with a single team. So 20 years later, uh, they've, there's been some metrics. Someone started saying like, how are we doing in Agile? So they want to do the same thing. They want to take their temperature. So they did the state of Agile. So this Agile report, 14 years old, Number one thing in the 2020 report that people do to start with Agile or Lean, or Agile because it's an Agile report, not a Lean report, is the daily stand-up. Yeah. Daily stand-up. So just imagine, Brad, if you and I are working together and we're trying to do something like a podcast, you know, if we're doing multiple shows together, in between recording, we might come together and just have a quick little huddle to see, like, what went well the last time? What did you like? You like that I was close to the mic or off center. And you might give me some feedback like, oh, there's like a city behind you. Why is nothing from Australia there? We're like, well, Brad, I haven't been to Australia yet, but we can change that, right? And then we don't problem solve in the meeting. 
but then we might identify things that you and I need to meet on later. And then we can get into experiments, positive experiments, safe to fail. And think about that, no matter what kind of contract you have or what kind of team structure you have, absolutely, if you ask another human being, can we get together for 15 minutes? What rational or irrational person for that matter, Brad's gonna tell you no. Yeah. If you're working on the same project, not likely. Yeah, it's such a small bit of time to get such a big outcome. Massive, and I wanna share, there's an example of this in our, in our construction company, we have five major regions that we operate in the United States. McCarthy operates from coast to coast. And in the Southern region, which occupies Texas all the way to Florida, so from like the middle of the country, and then halfway up the map, for those of you that know geography, if you're not American, you know the, the US map better than any American. Yeah. We're, 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 like, I'm, I gotta look at a map too, Brad. Like, I'm guilty too. Luckily, I grew up in the Midwest, uh, so I know at least where Illinois is and the Great Lakes. But yeah. So we have this region that's from Texas to the Atlantic Ocean and kind of goes up halfway up the country. In that group, they were uh, having a struggle with getting people help that they needed at the executive level. So one of the executives had heard about this daily huddle from one of the competitors or at a conference. I think it was at a conference. They heard this idea. It wasn't marketed as Scrum. It wasn't marketed as Agile. It's just marketed as like something good to do. Probably there's even a Harvard Business Review article about the power of a daily meeting, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> right, Brand? There'll be, there'll be many of them. Yeah. yeah, there'll be many. So you know, Brad, you, you read HBR. <laughs> yeah. So they, they instituted that daily huddle as an executive team and what they found is their staff meeting that happened once a week, the duration of that staff meeting decreased. And to the point where they said they didn't need to have that staff meeting. And they found that for the first time ever, and this was after the first week, in the first week of making this change, this safe to fail experiment, people started helping each other. Yeah. Just think about that, Brad. Yeah. Executives at a company that have to sometimes compete for resources in the organization started actually helping each other and things got better and things got so much better that, I mean, a, a year later, the company, that region started to exponentially increase its profit returns. We could maybe give some credit to the daily standup. We could. Yeah. Some people argue that it was just the market turning, but I disagree because we had had, you know, dec a decade of data before where that wasn't the case. And we'd had a recession and a change in economy before. So as a scientist looking at this, I would say like, you know, one variable change was leadership's approach was changed. Yeah. Yeah, I love it, Philip. And I love how it started with the executive there too. Like personally, I, I have seen that so powerful is when the daily stand up or whatever the choice of word is, starts with the executive. It gives them back huge right. amounts of time. Like when you calculate that time into money of meetings saved, it's off the, off charts. the charts. But it sets the t it sets the tone, doesn't it? Like like you're saying, I found it a key ingredient to actually get sustainability. Oh, the executive's doing doing it. Okay, well maybe it's good for me too. I'll I'll get on board with that bus. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Right on. People What's do that? pay attention to leadership, right? I mean, that's a yeah. That's a real human phenomenon. Like, if the executives aren't board on are not on board with something, why would I? in the same organization, do it. Yeah. If they're not doing it. Yeah. They're sitting in hour to hour meetings. Like, why would I do a 15 minute daily? Like, really? Like yeah. the way we do things around here is an hour to hour meeting. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the other thing, Brad, uh, just to, to pile back on, like, why would somebody want to do this is, you know, a lot of companies get by, they get by. And I was, I was just looking at my email. And I'm a project management professional from the Project Management Institute. And, and that organization is, you know, from the 70s. So it's even older than Scrum and Agile by a lot, yeah. decades more. Yeah. And one of the the titles that just came over in the, the annual or the last newsletter was called Beyond, Agil Beyond Agility. And in uh -huh. this article, they were talking about how and this is just marketing jargon, Brad. This is just, it's just, it's actually not beyond agility. It's still agility is what you're looking for. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that's just a catchy title to make you read. I fell for it like a sucker and I clicked on the article and I read it, Brad. So yeah. it got me. Oh. Their marketing people got me, Brad. They got yeah. me. I know. I've had the same. I've, I've, I've seen an article come through, I won't say where, but with a title called Nimble. The new, <laughs> the new way of doing things is this Nimble approach. And it's like, it just sounds like Scrum to me. <laughs> 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and in the article, they talked about uh, leadership and companies, enterprise-wide agility is what they were really focused on. And they're looking at organizations that during the pandemic were able to flex. And the faster you can flex or adapt, hmm, I wonder where they got that phrase from. Yeah. The faster they could adapt, the more likely they were to weather the the changes with the pandemic or just the harsh environmental constraints that the pandemic put on people where, you know, suddenly the world's population had to work from home or not work or, you know, do all kinds of different things that we never yeah. did worldwide. I think this was like the first time that worldwide outside yeah. of celebrating new years, that's something that we all do like yeah. on, a, on a regular rate that was like so prolonged. I mean, this, there's going to be some consequences to what we're seeing here. And this article was citing that companies that had this enterprise wide agility had like significant higher percentages of profitability, uh, employee retention during this tough time. Like here in the United States, we had record breaking unemployment numbers where, uh, we saw unemployment that was worse than the, the crash of the 1920s. Wow. Wow. It's nuts, isn't it? And, yeah. the, and like you say, the, there's still uncertainty to come, isn't there? So Definitely. that whole capability to be agile, but agile within a systematic way, isn't it? Like you, you're talking about some really cool systems that you can put in place to build agility. Like it's, it, agility isn't, and you're talking about running experiments and doing it in a safe way and learning from that, not just going and shooting from the hip. Yeah, please, and please don't shoot going from crazy. the hip. That's, that, you know, that's, that doesn't that's unpredictable. Well. That's, yeah. I mean, you at least have some kind of thinking of what you want before you start to experiment. I always tell yeah. people, like, if we're going to try something new, the first thing you do is you don't burn your house down. Like, your house is already providing you some kind of shelter, right? Yeah. So you can make little mods to it or go build a new house, but don't burn the yeah. house you're in. So a lot of the things yeah. in project management that I was taught, like things like these phases of initiating, planning, executing, monitoring and controlling and closing, like, that's not bad stuff in of itself. It's a little academic and prescriptive. A lot of that stuff is fluid and overlaps quite a bit, but just the way that it's presented, the words end and another word starts and you start to automatically think like initiating only happens at the beginning and there's no way that it can happen in the middle of the project. And nobody reads the fine print that says that when new stakeholders are brought on, you have to initiate them. You have to onboard them. Yeah. Like, you don't see that in traditional thinking just because of how the stuff is presented. Whereas like when you look at the scrum framework and you see, you know, a big circle with an arrow pointing out to infinity, and then you see a little circle for the daily and I can, you yeah. know, I can mess with, uh, I got some snaps technology here. Let me snap it. So I'll just throw that there for you for a second. So like when I'm talking about those arrows, you know, pictures oh, worth a thousand words, like there is not an equivalent diagram in pr traditional project management that doesn't show disconnected boxes or disconnected hierarchy with arrows pointing to it. Like you just don't have that type of thing. So this is a little more lightweight and uh, I think it's just pretty. Plus I drew it myself. So I'm kind of yeah. impartial to it. I'm, right? in, I'm impressed. Man. I'm impressed. Everyone, you <laughs> will put it in the show notes and do go to YouTube too, if you're listening on the yeah. podcast to see it. It's, it's the agile loops showing the loop of the product owner through their sequence, working with the teams and then this daily scrum and out to the resulting sprint review and retro. It's, it's really good. You've yeah, summed it up I, neatly. I, I, I told my friends at Scrum Inc. Like I, I like to use theirs too. Like when I can't remember what the three, five, three is, I just cheat. Yeah. And because it's free, you can just look it up yourself and then you can read, like, if you're looking at scrum, like what are the three roles? And this is where, you know, traditional project management, sometimes people want to, say that we got to get rid of titles and i remember i remember somebody in agile back in the early 2000s saying rip up your business cards and then we've iterated since then and now we say you can bring this into your fold yeah <laughs> right yeah. you don't have to that's people it. they kind of like their titles right brad yeah right like yeah. I li and so you can make you and i work. like podcast host it makes more sense than podcast scrum master yeah, no, that's it. That's it. And I think to it, it just takes away any resistance to being able to actually make gains. Like when you, you can end up arguing with someone and having a whole negative cultural outcome purely around a title on something. It's not needed, not needed. you know, because it's, 
it's the system that counts and the results you're going to get. That's what counts. That's what counts. We still need project yeah. managers and I'm a recovering project manager. So I know it took, yeah. there was a little <laughs> bit of unlearning I had to do as I started to think about agility because you know, people, they see themselves in like, if there's this body of knowledge on traditional project management, a lot of people right away think like, that's it. That's perfect. And they don't yeah. realize that that body of knowledge was created just in the 1900s it's new yeah. it is like super new and yeah it's, right, it's they're, amazing they're, i think there are buildings in australia that are older than project management as a profession yes. yeah and that's a statement because australia is not that old when it comes down to it right hey yeah hey philip so really it's been an amazing conversation on those key elements so the first one is take your temperature and, and get out of the whirlwind and up above and look and think and reflect and take stock. Right. And then it's from there, it's to know that extra people and extra resources won't necessarily fix anything. It can actually, no, unless you want to slow worse. down. Yeah. If you want to <laughs> slow your project down, add more people to it. Yeah. And then the other one is the whole daily, whatever you want to call the meeting, but it's that short, rapid 15 minute meeting that amplifies communication and performance, especially if you apply like the scrum framework. And then the other piece you'd been talking about is experiment and experiment and learn in a systematic way, not just right. to shoot from the hip top away. But Billy, what stops organizations doing this? Like you and I have drunk from the Kool-Aid. We, we are passionate about this. We've seen the results. It's amazing. But what stops in companies in the construction industry experimenting with this at least to see the gains? I think we can't discount all the failure stories, Brad. There are endless stories of people trying some of these agile frameworks or even just, you know, different parts of project management. And it's not been successful, you know, right now, like in construction, just in construction, Brad, the everyday construction worldwide, on average, three out of four jobs are late and over budget three wow. out of four. Wow. Right. That's what we talked about that, that potential. And why is that happening? There's been this massive specialization, Brad, that, that people keep specializing and specializing and the same we saw the same in agility too like when scrum first came out there wasn't an accreditation right that was born from a need right yeah. and then and when agile first came out there was it was xp it was scrum and i don't know what else De and devops and devops right and then eventually right. more things came and more was learned so it's like it grows over time and eventually those things become like dogmatic and people forget that an agile mindset is just one of continuous learning adaptation starting with the end in mind starting with the end in mind is an idea that's like probably as old as humanity and it's been made popular in various different books so a lot of the resistance from organizations in particular is that they're they're getting by and if you're getting by why would yeah. you start changing things brad like if you yeah. if you eat breakfast every day and you've lived 40 years would you stop eating breakfast all of a sudden unless you learn something or something happened to you yeah there's yeah. got to be a reason for change and like and, and even one of the books that uh, jeff sutherland had me read was uh one by dr cotter k-o-t-t-e-r who is like world famous for change management the first thing that he says that that is the the root cause of a failed change is no sense of urgency yeah so a lot of companies, Brad, if they're operating, if they were operating five years ago and they're operating today, mm. human beings just by default think that we'll be operating five years from now and we'll be operating yeah. 10 years from now and we don't need to even adapt. Like the no. customers are going to keep coming. They're going to keep buying our products and services. I mean, just that's what the bookstore industry was thinking when, when Amazon created their little website where you yeah. can buy like less than 10,000 books. And then fast yeah. forward to the pandemic and now Amazon delivers, you know, all over the world and they're getting into the shipping business. They're getting into the banking business. And that's a company with over 3000 scrum teams that are yeah. iterating and releasing changes to their product every day. I just turned my phone on today and I noticed that even just the Amazon app of my phone is completely new logo. It's now wow. a little box with a smiley face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're fast. They're, Isn't it? Jeff was saying twice a day or something like yeah. that. They're releasing. They're releasing almost continuously. And yeah. we're just not seeing in all these different areas, you know, where they're releasing. But I remember they're coming after, you know, shipping 
because they're so much of what they do is based on distribution. So they've got their own shipping container company where they've got boats on the ocean right now. Yeah. Wow. And they're, they're giving massive competition. I mean, we're all, we're all seeing that it's a, it's a globally co connected supply chain. Now, even in the construction industry, Brad, our architects here designing here, and sometimes even designing overseas for something that we're going to build here is requiring products from all over the world worldwide. Yeah. So it's a very interconnected world. So that's where I think a lot of the resistance in an organization is to just don't, don't rock the apple cart. Yeah. Right. If things it's are enough. okay, it's good yeah. enough, right? It's good enough. Yeah. And what that's really flips us back to that lean thinking book from WiMac again, wasn't it? Where one of those key elements was seek perfection. Seek perfection. Oh, but to see, but to seek perfection, you've got to have motivation. Right and uh, um, an emotional driver yes. to want to seek perfection. Absolutely. And that's what uh, I tell people, like, why why do I go after it so much? Like, you heard me in my early story. I started this, I was working seven days a week. So the driver for me was I couldn't keep up. And once I learned about thinking from, and just, this was just an idea, Brad. I didn't learn a yeah. method. I yeah. learned an idea of thinking what I do and tying it to how the customer is going to receive my work transformed what I was working on and delivered. My, my efficiency skyrocketed. I stopped working Saturdays and Sundays and I had time to walk the project site and I started learning on the job. How many people listening to this show can learn something while they're at work that's not mandated by their company? Yeah. I would argue the number is going to be very small. Yeah. Yeah. Again, there the opportunity's not there, and they're in in the role of just repeat, 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 right. repeat. I was listening to a, a podcast uh, yesterday. Actually, it's an Australian one, so globally people won't know it. But it was with a neuroscientist out of South Africa. He was saying that he studied consciousness, and that basic consciousness comes from the limbic brain, but the big part of our brain, the cortex. He said the main difference in humans he was talking about was the ability to reflect and reason so this big part of our brain he was hypothesizing it was still more of a hypothesis rather than 100 percent certain but he was saying that the ability is to reflect and reason and learn and then go forward differently but like right. what you're saying philip is that often as humans at work we don't have that chance to reflect reason think learn go forward because we just do 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 right and our, the brain, you mentioned the brain. I listened to quite a few neuroscientists podcasting as well, Brian. <laughs> the brain has this dopamine system that rewards goal achievement. Yeah. So every time you achieve, that's why people get addicted to smartphones and, and online gaming or even watching YouTubes or subscribing to endless podcasts. People, subscribe to Brad's podcast. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Hit that Same bell so, that Brad, so Brad gets a notification and – when he sees that he has more subscribers or in his downloads increase because the way his brain operates, dopamine will drip in Brad's brain. So all of you listening, if you want to get Brad's brain to drip a little more dopamine, just download more shows, you know, watch more podcasts and it'll happen. And with the, the on the flip side, Brad, on that, that neocortex, which is this front part where I have this gigantic forehead that some animals don't have as largely developed as we do. As far as we know, we're the only creature on the planet, as far as we know, because, you know, we don't know everything, that we can actually imagine ourselves in the future in the and in the past and imagine futures that don't exist. I mean, it's just that, that type of thinking and complexity. Like some people said that some of the freedom that some of the animals have, like dogs, like dogs don't suffer, even if they have something traumatic happens to them, unless it's conditioned trauma where it has to happen repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Like a dog can trip and slip and fall or something or have something fall on it and it does not make an association with that thing if it's a one-off. It doesn't suffer like people do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But we can we can associate things and, and feel things and put ourselves in places and even some of it is, you know, pick up pick up some of these things from how we grew up, right, as well. So it uh, it's really interesting that the uh, the neuroscience yeah. is out there. We're really starting to just tap into what it is. But you're totally right, Brad. You need that emotional trigger to want to try to do something differently. Yeah. For me, I got interrupted. It was that director talking to me. I saw how happy the people were. He challenged me to do something in order to learn more so that I can join that group. 
that was an interruption and a challenge. Yeah. And you know, had I, had I just said, no, thank you. I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Yeah. And that's what I love with your first point, which is that take your temperature because you've got to break out of the whirlwind of just what you're doing normally to take your temperature, to think, to imagine that future, to reflect on the past and to find that emotional trigger to move forward. It's really cool. Really cool. But it's, it's sad when you see people that are just burning out because they're go, 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 doing the same thing. But with, with someone starting their journey or a leader who has that moment of reflection, they're listening to this podcast, they're listening to another show on your EBFC show podcast. What would you say to them to start? Where would you say to them to kick off? Yeah, that's awesome. To be able to help this journey happen. Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing is you can, you can, if you feel comfortable by learning, and everyone has a different style, Brad, you can learn on your own and just something sparks your attention like if i said something you're like man i want to read that agile report then start with reading that agile report and then from there pick up some breadcrumbs and see what you go down to next like i started with someone challenging me to read womack's book lean thinking and then that created a chain reaction of many other readings and experiments and probably millions of hours on youtube brad yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know okay. but you know other people like to learn face to face so connect with me on social media. Like if you've got something on your mind and you're thinking, and keep in mind that I'm in California. So for all the Australian listeners, it's yesterday when you contact me. <laughs> There's a good overlap in time, but for the, like for, for the Australian listeners, if you haven't dealt with the West Coast of America, there is a good overlap. You are dealing with fleet yesterday. Yeah. But there's a good five, six hours of overlap. Yeah, you're in tomorrow. Business house just to be able to work. Yeah. I'm talking to the so future. Australian, man, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so Australian and New Zealand and and a lot of Asia can connect with you in business hours quite easily. Right. So if so for your listeners, I'd say connect with me on social media. And if you have a, a boiling question or you want a recommendation, I talk to everybody that messages me. That's just one of the things I do, Brent, because I wow. like to help and somebody help me and and I'll get to you eventually. Like, I think the longest someone's had to wait for me to respond on LinkedIn was a week. Yeah, that's impressive. That's good. That's creating a better future, mate. Like sharing the knowledge and then helping people as they reach out. So for Luke, the best way for people to reach out to you, one is through social media, through LinkedIn. What what other channels would you say to reach out or to oh, I'm check what you're Here, let me bring that snap back. So good places to connect with me are LinkedIn. It's Engineer Felipe or Felipe Engineer. I'm the only one. The EBFC show, and there's the website. Uh, at Felipe underscore engineer on Twitter. Or the Felipe Engineer on Instagram. Which Instagram is my newest thing I'm playing with, Brad. And yeah. So, But it's it's different. It's different than the rest. LinkedIn is probably the most likely to get me. Yeah. I figure too, it seems like Instagram's coming up. That's going to be a next path for me. I'm not there yet. Yeah, take your time, Brad. Take your time. It sounds like the business world is creeping in there quite strongly. Yeah, so, so let me snap that off. You like yeah. that, Brad? I got I I to teach you how to do those snaps. Later. I will. I'll be catching up with you afterwards on that one. <laughs> so, Philip, I really appreciate you coming on the show today and sharing knowledge to help such a massive industry and such a massive part of our world. It's truly, you have helped to create a better future and I know you will ongoing and Thank you so much for sharing, mate, and taking the time to come on. Yeah, thank you, Brad. Have a great rest of your day, and I uh, can't wait to hear from what's going on in the future soon. Thanks, Philip. Bye for now. There were two key takeaways for me from this episode. One, take your temperature. Two, experiment safely. Takeaway number one, take your temperature, is about taking the small amount of time needed to break out of the whirlwind of the day-to-day -day and reflect on how things are going. There is a scrum technique which really helps with this. It is called retrospective. Reflect on how things are going and note down what you need to keep doing, stop doing, and improve. These three simple questions will provide you some ideas and hopefully motivation to put them into action and help create a better future for yourself. Takeaway number two, experiment safely, is such an important thing to remember. Many people avoid doing things differently because of the time it will take in an already busy world. They are worried about the risk of failure and the fallout this could cause. When you understand the simplicity and speed of experimenting safely, this all goes away. Take your ideas from takeaway number one, your retrospective. 
and think about a way you could experiment with them quickly and safely to learn. This experimenting thought process creates a continuous learning and improving outcome for yourself. When many people apply this thought process in an organization, it creates a continuously improving and innovating company. Thanks again, Philippe. Really appreciate the knowledge. Bye for now.